Praise the Lord. Uh, sorry, can taking a minute to set up here. Uh, praise God for this uh, opportunity He has given me to bring the Word of God uh, here again to you this uh, this morning. I trust that uh, God has been faithful to you and uh, and answering your prayers and encouraging you daily, as He has been in our lives as well. Um, I'm going to continue in our discussion of the uh, topic that we've been covering uh, since the beginning of the year, which is looking unto Jesus, uh, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Um, since I'm hoping to cover uh, quite a few things today, I'm going to keep going, but I will just give a quick overview again, as Minu did last week, of where we are. Uh, we talked about uh, the forerunners of Christ in the Old Testament uh, for the first three months of the year. And then we spent a couple of months talking about uh, the birth of Christ and his early life. And uh, last week, uh, Minu uh, kicked off the next topic in our subtopic in this series, which is about his entry into uh, public ministry. And uh, we, uh, with this topic... Uh, and I'll give an outline of, of in a second here, um, what all that consisted of. <clears throat> and in, but in this topic, he transitioned from like his hidden years where he was living at home under the sub subjection of his parents and his family and being faithful uh, in um, kind of participating. Like, in fact, he was no, uh, called, isn't this a carpenter? in one of the Gospels, right? So they knew him, people in this town knew him as a carpenter. Another Gospel says, isn't this a carpenter's son, right? For a, up to the year, age 30, his identity was marked by uh, what his family does and who his family was, right? So, uh, which was their family was being carpenters. Just like many times, we, um, given, <coughs> excuse me, uh, given the uh, given the pressures and kind of the the uh, the uh, passions of the current world, many times we identify ourselves uh, by what we do, by what our status is in life, what our family is. And um, but Jesus is about to transition from those hidden years, right? So just like we are also hidden under the outward guise or identity of kind of who we are or what we do in the secular world, right? He was about to emerge out of that publicly into his true purpose for which he came to the earth, right? Amen? So, and uh, which is to show forth initially that he was the son of God and to call disciples and, and to go forth in his ministry as the anointed one of God. So uh, but so the first part of that, so I have a little map here, um, which I will kind of just talk about, uh, just want to spend a few minutes, because we don't spend a lot of time kind of discussing, you know, the a comparative study of the Gospels and kind of the events and timeline of things. I just wanted to cover, take a few minutes to cover um, uh, the series of events, uh, what I mean when I talk about his entry into public ministry. Um, and it's not a very clear kind of cutoff. It's something I just kind of put together. Uh, but one thing I will encourage you is when you read the Gospels, I would encourage you to read them, you know, uh, comparatively if you can, um, because each of the writers shows a different side of uh, of the events that took place. Um, but I will also warn you that um, just like, you know, many biographies or autobiographies skip uh, events. So like no biography is complete with every single event that happened in that person's life. Um, but I, I've read that the Winston Churchill's biography uh, was is one of the biggest volume a book about a somebody but even that leaves out it does not cover every single event that happened in his life so but there is harmony in all four books where it all 
works together without conflict or disagreement, but it's just each of the writers highlight different aspects of the life of Christ. Does that make sense? So, so if you read Matthew and how he covers from the baptism of Christ to the temptation and then the calling of disciples and his starting with miracles, Mark just brushes through that and just a few verses on all of that, right, in chapter 1. And then he launches, he focuses a lot on his miracles and the work, great works he did, just starting in verse 21 of chapter 1 of Mark. And in fact, uh, he skipped over several months, maybe up to a year or a year and a half of the first part of the public ministry of Christ. And Luke also, like Matthew, does take time to elaborate uh, different aspects of the initial ministry of Christ, his baptism and his temptation, just bring the different light to it. And then John, I believe, from my study, is the most chronologically laid out book, at least the first part of it, right? Uh, he does uh, skip over the temptations, I believe, um, <clears throat> and he doesn't explicitly mention the baptism of Christ. Um, so, but he does highlight, you know, other aspects of where Jesus went and all that. The reason I'm saying this, it's not, you know, this is less, this is more Bible study than actual preaching, this part that I'm describing. But it's important for you to know what you're reading when you're reading it, right? And not reject something because you think it's wrong. It's just each writer wrote a different aspect to highlight. Okay, does that make sense? So with that intro, um, so what I would describe as the first part of the public ministry of Christ where he emerged out of the hidden years into the public ministry. Minu talked about that very well last week, and that was with his baptism publicly uh, with, under John the Baptist. Oops, oops. Uh, and I'm not going to rehash that uh, and he talks there about that and the aspect of Trinity all being witnessing the, this event, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at his baptism. The other thing that you see in this initial stage of his ministry is John's witness. And we see that particularly in John chapter uh, 1, where John spends uh, several verses, you can see, he is declaring Jesus to be the Son of God. And and he's showing his revelation as, of Christ as the Son of God. It's interesting because you know John is his cousin, right? He says, I did not know him. But he's not saying, I did not know him one to one. But he is just at the baptism when he saw the Spirit of God descending upon John. Only then the eyes of his understanding was revealed to him that this is not just my cousin who's six years, six months younger than me, but this is in fact the, the Messiah, the Son of God that we've been waiting for. So the true revelation of God comes from within when we see Christ for who he is, right? You might know him, you know, through other people or kind of a superficial reading of the scripture, but until he's revealed to you in your heart, he doesn't become real to you. And that's what happened to John the Baptist. So he declared him and witnessed him publicly in fact, he, uh, Jesus, it says in two other Gospels that he started preaching as soon as John was put in prison. So I believe this witness of John and the fact that Jesus waited until he was put in prison to really start preaching is a passing of the baton like a relay race from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Okay? Jesus was patiently waiting until the right time to do all these things. So everything that we do should be with purpose and with intention. We're not, you know, just uh, kind of just doing things without a purpose or an intention or guidance from God in our lives. Everything we should do should be with purpose and intention. Amen? So anyway, so, John, so then this baton was passed to Jesus as part of his emergence into public ministry. And then he, I'll come back to the wilderness experience, but he immediately after that 
baptism was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to fast for 40 days and 40 nights, and at the same time was also tempted by the devil. We'll come back to that. And then he also spent the first part of his ministry calling the first disciples. Um, and then, uh, along with that, he spent time in Galilee, which is around where he grew up, because he got baptized. Uh, let's see if I can mark this. He got baptized around here, uh, uh, across from Jordan. Um, and then he went back up here, which is where he grew up, immediately after the baptism, and spent time calling his disciples. Some of them he called right at Jordan because two of them were followers of John the Baptist, uh, Peter and Andrew. And he came back to Galilee, called a few more disciples, and then he went with his family back to Jerusalem again, he went back, and he you know the story of him cleaning out the temple, right? He drove out people, the money changers, and he evicted people, and he cleansed the temple. And then he went back to Nazareth. I'm just giving you a, these are several days journey, right? So we read these verses and he compared them. I mean, you know, there's several things happening in between those verses. I'm just trying to give you a picture of it's not just simple things, right? Some writers skipped over some event uh, because they were trying to highlight something else. And then finally, he was rejected in Nazareth, and we'll come back to that. Um, and then he and his disciples moved to Capernaum, and it says that Jesus moved to Capernaum, which is where he launched his uh, ministry. Okay? Does it make sense? All right. So one of the things that you see as part of his emergence into ministry, you can see that Mary and his brothers even were with Jesus um, when he did the miracle in Cana, so in Galilee. It doesn't say if they were with him when he got baptized, but he may have picked, they may have joined him when he came back to Galilee. Um, and then <clears throat> um, he, they were with him when he went down to Jerusalem. It says Mary and his brothers and his disciples went down to Jerusalem with him for the Passover, which is when he cleaned out the temple. And that is the last time, I believe, where he, it discusses him being with his family as they're moving around. In fact, later, I mentioned this last time I spoke, Mary and his brothers were waiting outside and they told him, you know, your mother and your brother waits there. And he said, who is my mother and who is my brother? It is those who follow my word, right? So I believe this is part of the transition where he emerges out he leaves the shadow of his family, right? And he leaves his identity of being a carpenter or a carpenter's son to launch his actual ministry for which he came to the world. Amen? So I believe there's a reason little details are highlighted in the Bible, and let's pay attention to those details as we read the word. Okay, so that's just an intro on this phase of Jesus' life. Moving on to the next uh, section. I'll read Mark chapter 1, verse 12 to 13. And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beast, and the angels ministered unto him. Like I said earlier, three of the Gospels mention this experience that Jesus had immediately after his baptism, and which was that he went into the wilderness. This is very similar to uh, what Paul experienced after he became a Christian and he took baptism. He lived around Damascus for a while, and then he went into Arabia, and it says that before he saw any of the apostles, he spent three years from his baptism until he went to Jerusalem to meet, meet with Peter and James. In those three years, Jesus spoke to him directly and gave him revelation and uh, the gospel and the truth of the gospel. That's why many times, and you can read this in Galatians chapter 1, many times it says that I, what I have received of the Lord, I have given unto you, right? I believe that Jesus directly gave him the revelation 
and uh, commandment of all the things that he wrote about. Uh, it doesn't say much more than that about this. The reason I highlighted this and drawing a parallel with what Jesus went through was that many times when we launch into something, there's a time of testing. There's a time of a wilderness experience that all of us have to go through. Our master went through it, and so do we. Now, what does this wilderness represent? I think I, think I believe in Hosea, uh, it says, Draw, I drew her into the wilderness and shut all, her around all about that I may speak comfortably to her. Amen? We might have to go through a time of where we are separated from what is, maybe it's our family or a normal experience that other people have. You might like, why is this happening to me, right? Why are these things that I usually have, I'm able to do, just not able to do these things? Why do other people have a comfortable life while I am experiencing this wilderness journey, amen? I believe that it is ordained by God in all of our lives. It, in fact, it is inseparable to serving God is having a wilderness journey is inseparable to from the experience of serving Christ in our respective ministries. Because that's like I said in, about Hosea, that is where God gets our undivided attention and says the things that he wants to say. Just like he revealed to Paul directly. And it, when you learn things in the wilderness, those become real truths in your heart. Amen? Yes, we hear sermons. Yes, we read the word for ourselves. But when those experiences or moments where we go through true want, true dryness, and we experience the touch of God, we will never forget those truths that we learned, just like Paul wrote about many years later. Amen? The wilderness experience is crucial to the success of our Christian living. Amen? What happened in the wilderness? He fasted for 40 days. That means he, he uh, set aside his fleshy desires of which, uh, which is needed for his physical survival, right? But he, he created an atmosphere of rejecting that so he can focus on, on the next phase of his life, which was being in public ministry. And all the challenges and the and the, uh, and the demands that come with public ministry. He was preparing himself. And this is exactly the reason for the wilderness experience. So God can prepare us into a strong follower of Christ. And God, Christ, did Jesus need it? Or was he merely showing an example? He doesn't clearly say that, but I believe it was both. He put aside his divine nature and he was fully subject unto the leading of the Spirit. And it says clearly, all three occasions, um, <clears throat> where it says he went to the wilderness, it says the Spirit led him into the wilderness. That's what Matthew and Luke says, the Spirit led him into the wilderness. It's a different word. Whereas Mark says in verse 12, the Spirit drives him into the wilderness. And that word, the drive, I looked up the root word, means it is a coercion. It is that you can't ignore the voice that is telling you to now go into the wilderness. I believe if it is from God, you know, sometimes we bring, you know, trials upon ourselves because of the poor choices we made. I'm not talking about those, right? But truly when we go through an experience where we are being led into this time of testing or trial, God is assuring us, encouraging us, and leading us in those moments. This is part of, mat of the maturing as a Christian. Amen? So what, what else happened in, in the wilderness? We all know the famous one, which is the temptation of Jesus. And that is not, not my topic today, but we'll dive deeper into that in the coming weeks. But he was tempted of Satan. And in fact... It says, the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Amen? This sounds surprising to us, but uh, God allows our faith to be tested. 
It is a time where we are given a choice. Are we going to choose the path of God or the path of, of the devil or of the world? God, Jesus is showing us an example that we have that choice always with us. And he rejected the three temptations that the devil brought to him with the word of God itself. Amen? But I believe this is for us, uh, you know, a developing of the fruit of the spirit. The wilderness is where the fruit of the spirit develops in us. Especially self-control. For us to reject the temptation of Christ, we have to develop the self-control that comes from the spirit. We cannot reject any temptation without self-control. That's why in Galatians chapter 5 it says, you know, the, the, so that we can do what we want, right? The fruit of the Spirit exists within us so that we can do what we want. That self-control, that restraint, that holding back from just doing whatever comes our way is developed. That, that ability, that strength comes from the wilderness experience. Amen? So the devil is there in the wilderness to tempt us, to draw us away from Christ. So what do we learn so far? God speaks to us. God leads us into the wilderness. He strengthens us in the wilderness. And the devil tempt us, tempts us in the wilderness. And um, what else happens? There were wild beasts in the wilderness. So sometimes when we go through this time unexplicable things happen like all so what do the wild beasts represent what are wild beasts animals that act upon their raw nature right brutal nature where they come to attack and and to consume the same way sometimes things happen to us we can't explain why are these people attacking me why are these people trying to uh, insult me or just cause harm for no reason in those moments remember God may have allowed that to strengthen us further, to further trust in him, and to respond in the way that he leads us to respond. Right? Not responding to wild beasts like we are wild beasts ourselves. Amen? That's where the fruit of the Spirit is developed. Right? Self-control and love and gentleness and perseverance. All of these are developed when all of these things come against us and it is beyond our control. Amen? And finally, in verse 13 in Mark chapter 1, the angels ministered unto him. God doesn't just toss us in the midst of a trial and just leave us without help. Amen? His angels are there to uphold us. When we fall, they pick us up. In fact, one of the temptations from the Christ was, why don't you go jump uh, from the devil was, why don't you go jump from this tall building so the angels will pick you up. But Jesus knew the angels were already ministering to him. Amen. We're not trying to test God. But when God is testing us, he strengthens us with his angels that minister to us. Amen. He sends people to encourage us, bring a word to say, brother, it's going to be okay. I see you, but I've been praying for you. If God is encouraging you to go pray for somebody, follow that leading. Amen. Go call somebody. If somebody comes to your mind, call them or text them and say, I don't know why, but I've been thinking about you. I'm praying for you, brother or sister. Because angels are there to minister to us in the time of testing and trial. This is what happened to Jesus during his time of uh, wilderness. This was so crucial to his public ministry that he didn't do anything before he went through this. Amen. And this is a time, I would say, as an internal spiritual growth within ourselves. The fruit of the Spirit, which is internal to us. Our own edification happens through the wilderness experience. Amen? If somebody wants to do anything for God and as does not have the patience to be under His hand through trials and testing, I would question your intent. Amen? If Jesus did it and was submitted to it, if Paul subjected to it, why are we any different? Amen? Let us be under the hand of God 
and fully trust in him so he may lead us through these experiences and by it strengthen us. Now let's turn to Luke chapter 4. Amen. Luke chapter 4, verse 14 and 15. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. Now we can see, as he's emerging out of the wilderness, after a time of trial, after a time of fasting, what does it say? He returned in the power of the Spirit. Amen? We might think we get weaker at the end of the time of trials. Like somebody who runs a marathon for 26 miles, they are, uh, you know, however strong they are, they're usually a diminished version of themselves because they need to recover. But a Christian is the opposite. When we go through trial, we're made stronger and stronger. Our faith is grows gr uh, more and more. And we're transformed from glory to glory. The same way Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. This is why he went through the temptation and the wilderness experience. And then he's resumed or he began to teach in the synagogues. And they, it says in Mark that he, when he's taught, they, they were so astonished at the power behind his preaching, at the power behind his words, because they were like, this is not like the scribes or the Pharisees. They, he had authority. People can tell a difference. Somebody who's been through trials and then they minister. You can tell a difference when your anointing comes through your wilderness journey. And in your preaching is in the power of the Spirit because you saw and you spent time with Christ in the wilderness. Amen? And you were ministered to by angels and you were strengthened by His Spirit. So that is what we see from Christ Himself. So now I'm going to read on in verse um, Luke chapter 4, uh, last part of my message. <clears throat> I'm going to read, keep reading on from Luke chapter 4, verse 16 through 19. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, or Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. I'll read verse 22, uh, 21, 20 and 21 as well. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down, and the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is, a, is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. That's why what I said earlier, you can see in verse 22, they're saying, is this not Joseph's son? They are seeing, they didn't, may, they didn't see him in the wilderness. They didn't know what just happened. Sometimes people see us, and the authority that you have in your ministry, what happened? What changed about this person? Isn't this Joseph's son? What they didn't see was what happened in the wilderness. What they didn't see, the transformation that happened through the work of God in your life. The time of trial and testing, the strength that it built up in you. Amen? And they are seeing, wow, who is this? There is something different about him. What Jesus read was from Isaiah chapter 61, almost verbatim. Sorry. <clears throat> the Spirit of, uh, verses 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. 
He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Isaiah had one more phrase that Jesus left out, and the day of vengeance of our God. Amen? So what happened was the prophecy of Isaiah was fulfilled until the part that Jesus read, which is a time of grace. He emerged into public ministry and he said, I just fulfilled, he said that, in your eyes, I just fulfilled the first part of the prophecy, which is what we know in the timeline of the Bible as a parenthetical period, which is a time of grace. Amen? This time is where God poured out his grace upon the emergence of Christ in his death and in this time, the church age until his coming back. Is this time that Jesus said, this is now kicked off the clock, the start of the clock of grace. Amen? And what, this is what I have been anointed to do. And we'll get into that. And what Isaiah talked about in the last part of that was the day of vengeance of our Lord, which is the coming judgment of God. There is a span of the thousands of years between that, those two phrases, which we believe will come to pass very soon. But Jesus now launched these, uh, and the worship team, please come up, <clears throat> his public ministry with these words and said, this prophecy has been fulfilled. And what is he saying? What, what did he receive anointing to do? To preach the gospel to the poor. To heal the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance to the captives. To give sight to the blind. And to free them that are bruised. This is what Christ came for. To launch his ministry. This is why we go through trials. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians to comfort those who are, to comfort those who need comforting with the comfort we receive ourselves, Amen. Our wilderness experience is there so that we can comfort those who are going through trials themselves. Those angels I talked about to minister to others. Why can we minister to other people? Because we experience the wilderness ourselves. If we hold that back, we're holding back. The work of God that he's talking about here. Amen. You don't have to be on the stage to fulfill this passage. Amen. All of these things are within the ministry that God has ordained for us. And you can't do that without anointing. But those, that anointing is often received in the wilderness. And Christ is saying, who is the anointed one? He's saying, now I have been poured into now the spirit is overflowing from me and he is about to do great and mighty things to preach the gospel amen to to open the eyes of the blind and to heal the brokenhearted amen this is what we are called to do this is our ministry is to preach to those that need it or to set the captives free amen so let us just submit ourselves to god that, uh, and I'm going to just ask, let us all stand for worship. Uh, I'm going to lead us in a prayer real quick. And um, just submit ourselves before the word that we just heard. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the wilderness experience. Thank you for the spirit that grows stronger and stronger in us as we go through times of trial and testing and temptations. Lord, let us do grow stronger at the end of it than when we began. But let the spirit that was poured out in me be poured out unto others, Lord, to preach the gospel to the poor, to the meek, to the brokenhearted, to release the captives. Lord, anoint each one of us, Lord. Let us submit ourselves, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. May your mighty power be re revealed in us as a church body. From the least to the greatest, we pray for those who are doing ministry in the shadows without anybody seeing. And we pray for those who are doing ministry publicly, Lord. Anoint both equally. Let the power of God be manifested through their lives. And as you promised, greater things than these that you do through your spirit. 
the same spirit that rose up Jesus dwells within us. That resurrection power works through us. Let us be poured out completely to minister to the poor and the brokenhearted. Amen and amen.